Hello family, this is Masood Romandi. I'm back with another teaching on the book of Romans. We've had a great journey so far looking at uh, the gospel uh, and how this gospel brings us to a place of salvation and that is simply by the revelation of the righteousness of God. That means there is no salvation without the revelation of the righteousness of God. And we also looked at the righteousness of God uh, two sessions ago, uh, two weeks ago, uh, in the sense that this righteousness is not about our righteousness, it's about seeing him as being just and righteous in all his judgments, knowing that everything that he does is according to the truth. He's not partial. He's not doing anything out of anger or you know, being uh, trying to uh, punish us. It's all about God trying to be responsible for what he has created. So whatever he created that came to a place of distortion, now he's restoring. We call that salvation. Okay, We are being made whole. We are coming into the image of God. And that doesn't happen unless we first see God as he is. We see him according to what he himself uh, reveals. Uh, he's self-revealing himself in the person of Jesus Christ. And that simply means all that is true about him is being made known to us by Jesus Christ. That sets us free from the false image we had of God that uh, suddenly that image that was um, uh, false and wasn't able to speak or hear, uh, that no longer has any hold on us. That simply means we are not um, you know, in a place that there is no talk, there is no communication, there is no fellowship with God, because God is a spirit and a spirit speaks, and we are all spiritual beings, and there is that ability inside of us to actually communicate with Him. And guess what? If you are connected to the spirit, the life of the spirit flow, flows to you, and that simply means you begin to be filled with the knowledge of God, how He sees, how He knows, what, what He knows, and that is going to change us, all right? So now that is um, telling us that if you're looking for salvation, uh, if you're looking for a wholeness, um, uh, this is not something that we are trying to do right now. This is something that has been in us all uh, our lives. We've always been looking for, uh, we've been looking for something. Uh, that means th there was a lack inside of us. We were trying to, um, find something that actually uh, uh, fills that gap inside of us, fills that void inside of us. All right. So now, uh, what was that? What exactly is the thing that we uh, have been experiencing that has been a source of a failure inside of us that we are trying to overcome? All right. So that um, the book of Romans shows us that is a sense of righteousness. That is a sense of uh, identity. That's a sense of knowing who we are. That's a sense of belonging. That's a sense of uh, knowing whose we are. Because the moment that you have that, the moment that you have a sense of belonging, you, you, you know that you belong to someone, you belong to a family, uh, that gives you security. Imagine if you are alone. If you're in a country um, that you don't, you, you've moved somewhere that you don't know anyone, you don't have friends, you don't have family, uh, there is a sense of insecurity. You don't feel safe. And everything that you do in that new environment is um, influenced by this uh, basically sense of loneliness. Okay, so mankind has felt lonely. Why? Because you, were, you would never um, feel uh, that connection uh, with other human beings in a way that all that desire for belonging is fulfilled. Okay? Because all that we have in this world from um, parents, from uh, spouses from children, from friends, from, uh, you know, uh, family in general, all of that still is with human beings, all right? The human beings, all of them are uh, imperfect, and your belonging to them is always influenced by their imperfection as well. 
There is one who is perfect. And in him you have all security, all safety. All right, that is God and that is the one who has actually created us. Now, that sense of uh, belonging, uh, the moment that you belong to someone, then you find identity. And when, when you have the identity, you do what actually that identity is. So I'm going to show, I'm basically try, what I'm trying to say is that you first belong, then you uh, become, and then you do. Okay, that's the order. You belong to God, you know his son, and you do what the son of God does. You don't start with the doing. You start with, not even with your identity, you start with belonging. And in order to belong, you have to uh, know who he is. In order for me to belong to God, I have to know who he is. That's why uh, like two weeks ago, I uh, talked about the righteousness of God. And I said, this is not about our righteousness. This is not about us finding who we are. This is about first God being revealed. Okay. And the moment he's revealed, then the next step starts, which is now I uh, to be revealed or to be known to myself. Okay. And after that comes the doing. But now... Uh, all that the book of Romans is showing us that human beings have been trying to do this backward. So they want to start with the doing. They want to start with that work. Um, and that work brings them a righteousness identity. And then because of that identity, now you get to know God. It doesn't work that way. So it's the other way around. Now, um, this sense of work uh, has been with human beings the day that Adam and Eve uh decided that they would no longer live by the word they had heard from the Father. Um, and uh, they turned into the works of their own hands. Let me just quickly take you there, show you a few scriptures, and we will be uh, back to the book of Romans. Um, look at chapter 3 of Genesis. Um you know what? Let me just go back to Romans first, read a few verses to, so you see what Paul is telling us about uh, this works, and then we go back. So Romans chapter uh, 4, verse 1. What then shall we say that Abraham our father has found uh, according to the flesh? For if, if Abraham was justified by works, if Abraham was justified by works, he has something to boast about, but not before God. By the way, the reason he's saying this um, is uh, what actually we looked at last week. Last week, it was about positioning the law or putting the law uh, in its right place, uh, seeing that what the purpose of the law was. The law was not a source of righteousness. The law was a witness to the righteousness to come. Uh, so... Um, and we, we looked at that verse that speaks of, uh, sorry, chapter 3, verse uh, 31, that says, Do we take, do we then make void uh, the law through faith? Certainly not. On the, uh, on the contrary, we establish the law. And uh, we said that this doesn't mean that we are now adding the law to uh, grace, adding the law to faith. This simply means when we say establish the law, we're talking about putting it back to where it belongs. A witness, not a judge. The law is not a judge. The law is what's supposed to be a witness, bearing witness to something that was to come. And Jesus said, it was all about me. Now, because that is being said, Paul is adding another layer of clarity to what he has said and saying that, okay, so what about Abraham? Did he do anything? Did he work? Did he uh, get righteousness by works? Certainly not. Because if, had he uh, received righteousness, by works, then he had something to boast in the flesh. But before God, no flesh can uh, boast. It's not something that you do. God doesn't give something based on what you do. Otherwise, it he would not be just. He would not be righteous. All right. So that's when the context of gift is introduced. The, the concept of gift, which is grace. Righteousness by grace. Not a righteousness you gain by your works, a righteousness you receive as a gift by God. So all that you need is an embrace. 
arms open to receive this gift, hands open so God can put it in your hand, a body ready to be dressed up in the new identity that God is giving us. So I wanted you to, I wanted to make sure that you understand why now we are moving to Abraham uh, and uh, Paul telling us not even Abraham, uh, the great father of the Jews, uh, had something uh, to boast about uh, based on work. So when he says we established the law, we're not putting the law as a source for righteousness. So you do it and it becomes your works and you gain righteousness based on that. So verse um, two says, for if, if Abraham was justified by works, he has something to boast about, but not before God. For what does the scripture say? So now let's find out what actually the scripture says about Abraham. If it was not by works, if he was not justified by works, how was he justified? Abraham believed God and it was accounted to him for righteousness. Okay, Abraham believed God and it uh, was accounted to him for righteousness. Now you're coming to believing. Okay, uh, two sessions ago again, I talked about this faith that is the source of our righteousness is not our faith, it's the faith of Jesus Christ. Because uh, Jesus believed God. He came to understand everything that God said. He came to receive the revelation God was giving of himself. And by doing so, he did not embrace the harsh things that people around him were saying about God. And that means he did not take a false image upon himself based on what other people around him were saying, specifically uh, the religious of his days, those who knew the scripture but did not know the Father. And because of this, Jesus came to know the Father. And then he said, I have come now to make the Father known to you. And that simply means nobody has ever done this. Nobody has ever made known the Father to human beings. Jesus is the first to come and make the Father known. Not to say that just simply you have a Father, not just to uh, say that God is his Father, but to actually give us a true uh, representation through demonstration of who God is in all his attributes, apart from the lies that mankind has said about God. All right. So uh, now Abraham uh, believed God. And I said, so that puts a faith inside of you. Now from his faith is something being transferred to you and it becomes your faith. From the persuasion of Jesus, something is being transferred to you and that becomes the persuasion in your heart. And that's simply what Romans chapter one also told us. He said, um, the gospel is the power of God unto sal salvation uh, for uh, verse 17. For in it, the righteousness of God is revealed from faith to faith. That simply means what Jesus believed was transferred to us and became what our belief. Something that he knew became something that we know. Something that he was persuaded of is something that we are persuaded of. So now we see him as he is. So. Uh, now we are introduced to something that Abraham did, not by works. Abraham also experienced something in his heart called believing. Look at chapter 4 of Romans once again, verse 3. For what does the scripture say? Uh, say? Abraham believed God and it was accounted to him for righteousness. Now let me just continue and I'm going to come back. Verse 4. Now to him who works... The wages are not counted as grace, but as debt. Let me read it again. Now, to him who works, the wages are not counted as grace, but as debt. So this is simple. It says uh, that if someone works, just look at the natural example, a labor, someone that uh, goes, gets a job, and by the end of the day, he's being paid. So once he's paid, uh, that payment is a debt that uh, the that uh, the one who employed him 
uh, basically owes him. Uh, let me just say it in a more sim in a simpler way. So when a when an employer employs an employee, uh, the employee begins to work. At the end of the day, he gets uh, money, and that's the wages for what he has been working for. So he gained what he worked for. Okay, so that means that employee owed something to him. And if you apply that to God, that means God, uh, if this was the case, if it would work, that means uh, that God owes us something. And what he gives, it's not a gift. It's a debt that is being paid. But we already established that there is, uh, there is nothing that you can do uh, that actually can cause you to be qualified to receive something that is available only by grace. Because before you were born, the gift of God, the, the gift of the grace of God was given. I think this was in um, maybe God's master plan that actually we covered this uh, grace that was given to us before, you know, uh, the world began. The, the grace. Uh, is not something that comes in place because of uh, the one that is going to receive it. Grace is a quality, an attribute in the one that wants to give it. So uh, w when somebody gives a gift, he doesn't give the gift because of uh, how deserved the person, the receiver is. The giving of gift comes because of the state of the heart of the giver. Like when you want to give a gift to a family member, it's not because you have to, it's because you want to. It's because you love that person. You want to give them something. Um, like, for example, uh, if you have kids, do you give them something because they have done? No, I know that we do at times, uh, but uh, God is different. God does things because he loves, and that love causes him to move, to give whatever is inside of him, whatever is in him to become ours as well. So God doesn't give identity to us because we work for it. God gives us identity because we are born of him. So the believing part is not really something you're trying to do. It's something that happens to you, again, because of the gospel that you have heard. And the gospel is simply revealing God's righteousness, that he's just and righteous. All right. So therefore, um, now let me just continue to verse five to see who this God that is ju just is um, and he's righteous. Who is he? Verse five. But to him who does not work, but believes on him who justifies the ungodly. OK, it says um, we are talking about a God that justifies the ungodly. Like, I know justifying the godly, but what do you mean by justifying the ungodly? Like, in this world, you justify only the person that is, um, hasn't done anything wrong. But the ungodly is like somebody that is exactly opposite to God. And yet God says, I justify you. Why? Because it's not according to what you have done. What you need is to... <clears throat> Be able to see the truth. Okay, let me just say it again. The when, when we read that um, righteousness is a justification that is given by God, and it's given to the ungodly, not to the godly. The godly doesn't need justification. It's the ungodly that needs the justification. So it says now, when we say believing, it's not like you hear something and if you believe something happens to you. No, because there is a truth, you're able to believe. I'm going to say it again. This is about believing, Paul says, uh, to him who does not work, but believes on him who justifies the ungodly, his faith is accounted to him for righteousness. This him that we are talking about, God, he says he's the one who justifies the ungodly. He justifies the ungodly. So 
That means God closes his eyes to what you have done. And he reveals himself to you. And shows you who you are because he is showing you how he sees you and how he has created you. Let me say it again. God justifying the ungodly. This ungodly, of course, uh, you know, is someone who has done everything wrong. <laughs> um, and yet he is being justified. That justification is not based on you believing. That justification is in the gospel that is being preached to you is showing who God is and is showing who you are and you believe it. Your believing simply makes this righteousness operative inside of you. That means it changes your life. You're being transformed because the truth is already in place. But freedom comes by knowing the truth. Truth doesn't change if you believe it or if you don't. But once actually it becomes something that you believe, you hear it and you believe it, that truth expels all the lies inside of you, removes the veils that the, the veil that was over your eyes, softens the heart that was as hard as a rock. So believing comes after uh, the truth being established that God justifies the ungodly. God does not condemn. God justifies. If there is condemnation, it's not from God. It's from the law of commandments. And a conscience that is uh, defiled by the knowledge where, that comes from the literal reading of the law. In Christ, which is in God, there is no condemnation. In Christ, there is the revelation of the righteousness of God. See, emphasis must be on him who justifies the ungodly, not on the ungodly. I'm going to say it again. The emphasis must be on he who justifies the ungodly, not on the ungodly. Abraham believed God, and we believe on him who justifies the ungodly. Why? Because, I mean, once you hear this truth, would you resist it? Or would you be completely open to embrace it? Of course, it's the second one. Now, uh, this work thing, uh, when, it, when we say works, it's, <clears throat> it's not actually what you do with the work with, with your hands. It's, some, it, it's a state of the heart. Uh, and I'm going to show it to you. Uh, Look at Genesis chapter um, 3, where all the issues come from. And this is exactly where Jesus picks up to fix the issues. This is the first man, Adam. Chapter 3 of Genesis, um, verse 17. Then to Adam he said, Because you have heeded the voice of your wife, and have eaten from the tree of which I commanded you, saying, You shall not eat of it. Cursed is the ground for your sake. In toil, in works, you shall eat of it all the days of your life. Both thorns and thistles it shall bring forth for you, and you shall eat of the herb of the field. In the sweat of your face, you shall eat bread till you return to the ground, for out of it you were taken, for dust you are, and to dust you shall return. Did you feel the works? Did you see the works, the toiling, the sweat of the face, and all of that? And he says, all of this works is because something is cursed. And he said, the thing that is cursed is the ground. And it is cursed because of what you ate. And what you ate was the knowledge from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Pay attention. It's a knowledge. You eat a knowledge, 
But you, where do you send that knowledge t- through your mouth into your belly, or perhaps through your ears into your heart? Because the knowledge is not meant for your belly. The knowledge is meant for your heart. So the knowledge of good and evil caused the heart to be filled with a knowledge that brings death. And God says, now, there was a ground so great that God wanted to bring life in it and through it. But then something happened. Jesus comes in uh, Matthew chapter 13 and tells us a parable, which is the first parable about the uh, kingdom of God. And he, in fact, said, if you don't understand this parable, how would you understand other parables? So this is the very key to understanding parables. And in this parable, you know, it's the parable of the sower and the seed and the ground that the seed was planted. Now, let's see the interpretation. You've heard it over and over. I'm not going to read the mystery part. I'm going to go to the revelation part of it given by Jesus himself. Look at Matthew chapter uh, 13. Um, And uh, verse 18, the parable of the sower, sower explained. All right. So therefore, hear the parable of the sower. When anyone hears the word of the kingdom and does not understand it, um, the the wicked uh, comes to it. Uh, Let me see if I'm in the right place. Um, Let me just jump to uh, verse 23. Verse 23, it says, But he who received seed on the good ground. Okay, so remember, uh, God said to Adam, Cursed is the ground. Cursed is the ground. Jesus says there is now a good ground. That means it's not a cursed ground. It's a blessed ground. It's a blessed ground. Okay. So then he says, let me just explain what that means, this blessed ground. He who received received seed on the good ground is he who, remember, hears the word. He who hears the word. What did Adam and Eve hear? The knowledge of good and evil. I said it wasn't meant for the belly, for the mouth and the belly. It was meant for the heart, ear and the heart. Same exact thing Jesus is saying. But he who received seed on the good ground is he who hears the word and understands it, who indeed bears fruit and produces, uh, and produces. Okay, I don't want to continue. Produces. So, uh, in I think another uh, gospel, he says, "This is he who, with a good and noble heart, receives it." There is a seed uh, that is planted, that is sowed, and it produces. And he says, "The where this seed is received is called a good and noble heart. It's the one that he hears it and understands it and believes it." This is the one who will produce. But then to Adam said, cursed is the ground. So what was really cursed? His heart. Did God curse uh, that ground? No. So did God curse man's heart? No. What cursed it? What was planted in it? What was that? The knowledge of good and evil. What that knowledge did to Adam and Eve was to now toil, to labor. So simply a heart that is in labor. What is that? It struggles to believe. Because once the heart, if the heart is not good and noble, that simply means it can't believe. So when we are coming to the revelation of uh, the righteousness of God, Uh, We're talking about uh, God sowing in our heart the word of truth about himself. 
And once the heart receives, uh, once actually you hear it, uh, that begins to change the ground. That begins to change the heart. That begins to bring the heart out of unbelief, perhaps to doubting what you had believed, to a full assurance of faith. That's the entire ministry of Jesus Christ, that by his blood, our heart could be sprinkled from evil conscience, and you could come to the full assurance of faith. Concerning what? Concerning that which God has now spoken in the Son. That which uh, was by the prophets spoken before as a witness, but God no longer speaks through the prophets because we have come to the last days, because we have come to a place that no longer a prophet is needed. We have come to a place that the true image himself has come down to show us the truth about the Father. And that's how the book of Hebrews starts. God, who at various times and in various ways spoke to our fathers through the prophets, has in these last days spoken to us in his Son, who is the heir of all things. He is the express image of his person. It's the exact image of God. And when he by himself purged our sin, sat down at the right hand of the majesty on high, waiting until all his enemies are made his footstool. That simply means when he um, removed the sin, when he actually by the revelation of his sacrifice, by the revelation of his love, showed us that God had passed over from the sins that were uh, committed, now he's sitting on the throne reigning uh, over us and for us and putting every other enemy under his feet for us because now we are body of Christ and he put all things under the feet, which is the lowest part of the body even. So he's inside of us and he wants to bring us to the full salvation, to the wholeness that he himself is because Jesus means salvation, becoming one with him in all things. So now this uh, works uh, is where the heart, therefore, is a struggling to believe the true message of God. That's why believing comes uh, as the a key or as the solution to this big problem. And I said, the believing is when you begin to hear the righteousness of God. And that righteousness of God is revealed to us in the good news called the gospel. Um, all right, so I think I'm going to stop here. Um, but let me just go back quickly to uh, Romans chapter 4. Romans chapter 4. Uh, once again, verse 5 says, But to him who does not work, but believes on him. So that means you stop trying to believe and you believe. <laughs> that you stop trying to believe because uh, if you're trying to believe, you're still focusing on you. And I said, never start with you, start with God. Never start with the ungodly, start with him who justifies the ungodly. Because if you do this, uh, that message that you're hearing is going to change the heart. It's going to put you at rest instead of works. Why? Because you see God at work. And you see him at work in the person of Jesus Christ. And you see he did everything to prove to you that God loves you. That's the entire message of the gospel and believing that will set you free. So uh, I think I've, I, I talked about the believing also uh, in the first few uh, uh, sessions of this series. You can go back and watch that. That would be a great, uh, a great video to watch alongside this one if you haven't. Uh, but I hope that you're seeing that the pieces of the puzzle are coming. Some of this stuff that we had heard over and over um, now have a a meaning for us. There is weight uh, in uh, what is written actually in the scripture. We don't anymore just uh, move quickly over scriptures because we don't understand them. Uh, we just 
take all the juice that is in every one of these scriptures because one by one they reveal a part of this great mystery which is Christ in us and that work begins uh, in us by him not by us trying to do the work and his work uh, is perfect everything that he does is perfect so let's focus on him his righteousness uh, his faith and his ability to justify not us trying to believe that we are righteous okay bless you i'll see you next week